Hello and welcome to this joint forum on humanistic approaches to climate change, uh, which is being hosted jointly by the University of Chicago and by Peking University. I am Deepesh Chakrabarti, currently the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History and South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. I will be moderating to this moderating this panel discussion uh, on, as I said, humanistic approaches to climate change. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. To listen to today's program in Mandarin, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select Chinese. Please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit questions in either Chinese or English throughout the event. The topic, as I said, is humanistic approaches to climate change. As you know, climate change names a bundle of problems and challenges that have so many aspects to them, scientific, technological, economic, and policy implications, as well as aspects that have to do with values, individual and institutional choices, issues of justice between humans, between humans and non-humans, and of course, large questions that bear on our ideas of civilization and good life, the good life. I feel extremely privileged to have with us some very distinguished colleagues on this panel who will address many of these questions. And let me introduce them in the order in which they will speak. <clears throat> First to speak will be Professor Roger Emmes. Professor Emmes is the Humanities Chair Professor at Peking University and Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He has made significant contributions to the study of Chinese and comparative philosophy. The next speaker is Professor Fu Jun, who is a Professor of Political Economy and Public Policy at the National School of Development and School of Government at Peking University. His research interests include mathematical modeling, institutional political economy, and related policy and legal issues. The third speaker on the panel is Professor Elizabeth Chatterjee, who is an assistant professor of environmental history in the college at the University of Chicago. Her research explores how non-Western energy histories disrupt conventional understandings of capitalist development, the social dynamics of climate change, and green political thought. And the last speaker on the panel is Professor Dale Jamieson, who is Professor of Environmental Studies and Philosophy, and the founding director of Envi Environmental Studies at New York University. His recent work concerns the nature and uses of love, political theory for the Anthropocene, and the complex relationships between environmental and animal protection. I will now invite Professor Amis to share with us his expertise and perspective. Professor Amis. Thank you, Dipesh. Um, we live in the best of times, we live in the worst of times. Uh, the human being is a magnif magnificent animal that we have developed the science, the technology to deal with global problems, something like world hunger, that if we activated the science that we have, we could move very quickly to alleviating a world hunger. And so the, the problem is not a technical problem, it's a moral problem, it's an ethical problem. Um, we live in the worst of times, that we have pandemic and global warming and environmental degradation and food and water shortage, income inequity, uh, proxy wars, and, and, and so on. The list is, is long. And these are not problems. They are they're a predicament, the human predicament. The difference between problems and predicament is that in order to you solve a problem, but you have to have the resolve for a predicament to change intentions, 
values, practices, that we have to live in the world differently if we're going to address this perfect storm. Now, the perfect storm has at least four things in, in common. Um, number one, the human being is complicit, that we bear a large responsibility for the predicament. Secondly, the predicament has no boundaries. Uh, pandemic, environmental degradation doesn't care if you're, if you're American, Chinese, or Ugandan. Um, it's all the same. Uh, thirdly, there, these problems are, are organic, that they, you can't solve one without addressing the others. Zero sum. And fourthly, that collectively, collectively, we human beings have the cultural resources to take a good run at resolving uh, this predicament. Now, uh, James Cars is a, a historian who gives us a, a distinction that, that can be helpful for me in talking about con a Confucian contribution uh, to this, um, to, to responding uh, to the perfect storm. Uh, he talks about infinite and finite games. Games are the things that human beings do. We do commerce, we do sports, we do um, security, we do international relations. And finite uh, games are played by individual actors according to a set of rules, a beginning, an end, and a winner and a loser. Um, and this we would associate with a kind of individualism, uh, an ideology of individualism at, at every scale, at the individual, at the corporate level, at the, at the level of the sovereign state. And so finite games are very familiar. They, they uh, uh, are congruent with uh, enlightenment uh, concept of, of the human being. But, but infinite games are different. Infinite games are me and my granddaughter strengthening our relationship so that together we can confront the increasingly complex issues of our time. That, that infinite games um, are about strengthening rela relationships. There's no beginning, there's no end. Uh, there's the idea that we either win together or we lose together. And so what I wanted to do, the contribution that I wanted to make, uh, Depeche, to our, our conversation today is to talk about the difference between human beings that has a deep roots within the Western uh, uh, cultural tradition and what I want to call human becomings um, that I want to associate with the, with the Confucian uh, tradition. I want to draw a contrast between ontological thinking, categorical thinking, uh, and what I call zoetological thinking. Uh, that is the idea of not being, but becoming. Uh, not a science of first principles, but rather a, um, a, 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 an art of living. So I'll stop there, uh, Depeche, and um, uh, yield the floor. Thank you very much, Roger. I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to many of the questions that you've raised, and I'll invite Professor Fu to make his remarks, please. Thank you, Depeche. Um, as a follow-up of, of uh, the previous speaker, um, Professor uh, Roger Ames, uh, I heard that uh, if there is a tension between individualism and the collectivism and the balance is too much on the side of the individualism, ultimately we face uh, what the scholars would call the tragedy of the commons uh, in connection with uh, the issue of climate change. And to now, to begin my remarks, um, I would uh, go back to a uh, fundamentally uh, humanistic puzzle. That is, uh, given the fact that we humans uh, uh, are relatively brief in terms of our history uh, of presence on this planet called Earth relative to other um, living creatures. The puzzle is that why we were able to dominate the animal kingdom. Now, the um, answer I would suggest is uh, what many scholars would call axiomatic evolution. 
by which I mean we human beings, uh, in addition to the internal evolution, long time eternal evolution, we, were, we choose the strategy to build tools and instruments, including what I would call institutional technologies. These are the things that are external to our uh, body, such that we were able uh, to dominate this animal kingdom. Uh, given the fact, relatively speaking, in terms of muscles, we, were not, we are not the strongest. And that evolution of process uh, was sped up uh, in the wake of scientific revolution, in the wake of industrialization, uh, urbanization, and little did we realize that while we're doing this, uh, we have uh, consumed an enormous amount of energy to empower those, uh, uh, what I would call axiomatic uh, evolution. Example being uh, AlphaGo uh, is now able uh, to beat the Go players. This is very amazing. But the fact is that AlphaGo will assume in terms of uh, the power that it use many times more than the human brains uh, would consume. Now, this is an amazing saga of a humanistic uh, uh, progress. But now we realize if we continue this process, uh, we, that process also give rise to um, what we call existential threat. In other words, uh, with uh, the climate change, the light rising of uh, uh, climate, uh, the temperature uh, will destroy the ecosystem upon which our life lives on. So depending on which direction we're going, whether we'll negotiate ourselves out of this uh, threat or uh, expedite this uh, danger, this is the great challenge that we face. But initial evidence suggests the way we human beings have realized we have to reverse the process using, continue to use uh, axiomatic evolution. In other words, we need to reverse a course from an energy structure that is a fossil based uh, as a result of industrialization to non fossil based uh, energy structure. Basically, the way we're moving forward in this great transformation or saga, the humanist saga of uh, travel is uh, continue to use the four, what I would call four sets of technologies. One is low carbon technology as we continue to move forward. The other is a zero uh, carbon technology. And the third one is uh, negative carbon technology. And the fourth one, Combining all three is what I would call institutional uh, technologies, which by which I mean uh, market. Market, uh, remember, is a humanly made institutions that would in align incentives with human values, a change of values. What is a good life? So that you can encourage the direction of moving towards a green economy. Let me give you an example of low carbon technology. Low carbon technology is for every GDP you produce, you uh, lower the intensity of energy use. Uh, now, China has been very aggressive in doing this as we continue to move forward uh, prior to 2030. And uh, as a first, uh, phase of our uh, strategy is to emphasize low carbon and, uh, technology. At the meantime, we are very aggressive in developing zero carbon technology. There I'm talking about uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, solar, uh, wind, hydraulic power. These are uh, green technology. Now, what example of negative technology? There I'm talking about uh, CCUS, carbon capture utilization uh, uh, and, and the storage. Uh, so you are looking at the four, four sets of technology, uh, a reflection, a, a example of uh, what I would call the axiomatic human evolution. But now uh, with the value towards uh, green uh, technology. And this is an amazing human saga to reverse the process.
And now let me give you some numbers, uh, citing China example, but you can take that as uh, a reflection of uh, the struggle uh, of mankind. For China, uh, the, if we look at uh, uh, CO2 emission, uh, the share of uh, the Chinese uh, contribution was uh, roughly a quarter. Uh, as uh, the, uh, the center of the manufacturing house of the world uh, for the time being. So uh, much of the efforts is reflected of what uh, China is uh, doing here. Now, the current energy structure in China, roughly speaking, without being precise, is about 15% uh, green uh, energy, uh, roughly 85% um, fossil-based energy. And China has made a commitment to a peak uh, CO2 emission prior to 2030 to the international community uh, and to neutralize carbon emission by the year 2060. Now, this is a gigantic, very tall task for developing economies. Uh, once they peak, uh, carbon emission, they have uh, roughly speaking 50 to 70 years uh, time for transition. Whereas uh, uh, for China, we only have uh, 30 years for this uh, transformation. And uh, we'll see what will happen. And uh, if we are successful, uh, then this is a truly a very dramatic transformation of the way that we live to move from a fossil-based energy uh, structure to a non-fossil-based energy structure. I wish the best of luck to humanities. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by saying something surprising for a historian, which is that we have never seen a predicament as humans like this one before. And by this, I mean, we now know, thanks to the insights of Earth system scientists, that basically all of human civilization as we know it, from agriculture through to literate civilizations, has occurred in a basically stable climate in the period we call the Holocene, about the last 11 and a half thousand years. We are now exiting that stable climate envelope. So the past, does not look like our future is going to. That doesn't mean, though, I hope to assure you that history has nothing to teach us. What I think it does mean is that we have to think about climate justice in a new way. There's a classic paper by the Indian environmentalists Anil Agarwal and Sunita Narayan that came out in 1991, just before the Rio conference that set up the Conference of the Parties, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And they argued in that seminal paper, Global Warming in an Equal World, that we needed to think in terms of countries' rights to basically carbon space, to an equal share of planetary sinks that would swallow up all our pollution, the atmosphere, the oceans. We all know that a disproportionate share of emissions historically has been emitted by the United States, about 20%, more than 20% since 1850, far and away the largest share of any country. Second is China, coming up at about 11.4%, but of course, with a much larger population. So this is one way of understanding climate justice. The problem is, the earth does not like allow us to think about climate justice in these familiar terms. Already, we can see in the region that I and Depeche study in India, um, that the country has suffered catastrophic heat waves um, and recently in Pakistan floods. China too has also been suffering with drought. We all know that this is the first sign of climate impacts hitting us. And so the earth itself does not allow us to take a purely retrospective or historic perspective on climate justice. It forces us to act. The planet, the predicament that we're in, means that we have to act. We know that this is a cosmic injustice 
that the very centres of the first industrial revolution, my homeland of the UK, or Chicago, where I sit now, are likely to be spared the early worst effects of climate change, while much of Asia and the global south will not. This is a cosmic injustice to my mind, but it's one that we cannot just wish away. We have to act. So what does that mean then if we have to act? Well, of course, responsibility matters, but I do think climate justice needs to be uniquely forward looking. And in this way, it requires a kind of imaginative leap. I really like Professor, Fu, Professor Fu's framing that we need new institutional technologies. To my mind, this is one of the issues that we face. Our politics don't give us a way to think about very long term ways of thinking. So how can we think about getting to 2050 or 2060? I'll be an old woman. I think here I would love to hear from you all about the kinds of procedures that we need to tie our hands to make sure that even in moments of crisis, dark times, we act in the interests of future generations. That means thinking differently, I think, about representing children, about representing as well the non-human, and about accountability to make sure we keep our promises. It also means new moral norms. We are very fond of saying, think of your children, think of my children. But what about people who aren't our children, who have little in common with us? We heard uh, from Pre Professor Ames that climate impacts cross borders. They cross generations. They will also cross species. How can we think of these solidarities in ways that cross national nationality, that cross generation? Well, I find signs of hope actually, if we actually do look to the past. And I think Professor Ames has given us one good way of thinking about this with reference to Confucian values. But we also might think about other sources of solidarity in the past that go beyond national boundaries. I'm thinking here of ideas of Pan-Asianism that went well beyond the nation state in the 20th century, often actually faced with the Imperial West. I'm thinking as well about the fact that we don't need to always give things up in order to live a more frugal but better life. Perhaps the society that's gone through the most rapid energy transition has been Cuba under US sanctions and later with the collapse of the Soviet Union that provided it with energy. Cubans actually became much healthier during this period in which emissions dropped radically by about 30% in only five or 10 years. So there's hope there, I think. And I look too to sources of success where the world really has come together. I think of the ozone crisis and the Montreal Protocol. It is possible to come up with deals that recognize power asymmetries and take them seriously while compensating those who lose. So I think even though the future doesn't look like the past, I see all sorts of sources of hope in how resilient, how adaptable human societies have been when facing previous environmental and other crises. Thank you, Liz. Very thoughtful remarks. And uh, now I'll invite Dale, Dale Jamison, to as the last speaker on the panel. Uh, to well, I'd like his thoughts. I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking both Peking University and the University of Chicago for giving me the outsider to these two wonderful institutions, the opportunity to be on this panel uh, from which I've, I, I've already learned uh, an, an enormous amount. Uh, I wanna begin by with, with, with some sobering remarks. Um, it's, it's difficult to stare reality in the eye. But the fact is that we are living with climate change and it will become even more destabilizing over the next few decades and perhaps centuries. At this point, climate change can no more be prevented than nuclear weapons can be recalled once they have been launched. Climate change is already resulting in famines, floods, and droughts. These impacts will become more extreme. And 
increasingly this will lead to violence, to further injustices and political destabilization. For us as individuals, climate change will disrupt our relations to our past and to our future. It will shatter our sense of place and it will destabilize the expectations that many of us have. And as a result, our children, everybody's children, will not have the same relations to the past as their parents, nor the same sense of future that we have. Now, whatever we think of this, these are really just the cold, hard, sobering facts. The time in which these impacts could have been forestalled or prevented is really now past. The challenge that we face is how to live well and meaningfully in the world that we are well on the way to creating. Now, in order to do this, I think, there are at least two dichotomies that must be overcome. I mean, from, from what I've said so far, you might think that what I'm saying is we have to adapt to climate change, we have to give up on mitigating climate change, not think anymore about reducing emissions. This is not the case. There is no choice to be made between mitigating climate change, between reducing emissions and adapting to the climate change that is underway. We must do both. And in fact, there are policies that have both effects that we could talk about in the discussion. It matters whether climate equilibrates at two degrees centigrade, three degrees, three degrees centigrade, four degrees centigrade, whatever it may be. The impacts become increasingly exponentially devastating as the world warms. But whatever the extent of the warming, we will have to adapt to it in order to survive, in order for what is meaningful and important to us to survive. So the first dichotomy we have to get beyond is the dichotomy between mitigating climate change and adapting to climate change. The second dichotomy we need to get beyond is the idea that climate change requires either collective responses or whether it can be individually addressed. Our societies, our institutions, our norms must and will change, but so must and will our individual behavior. For example, given the climate, health, and environmental impacts, of animal agriculture, industrialized world diets cannot persist in a climate change world. Much less can they be globalized to the rest of the world in the way that is now occurring. This is a challenge for governments, but it's also one that we face every day as individuals when we decide whether to eat a plant-based meal or to go to KFC. Our individual choices add up, they aggregate, and they also encourage or discourage, enable or disenable policy changes, collective responses that are required. Now, some of the challenges of climate change are unique. For example, the scale and the rapidity of the change, and the deeply tragic fact that we persist in imposing climate change on ourselves and the rest of life on this planet in the face of the best scientific knowledge in the world telling us what we are doing and where we are heading. But 
Other challenges of climate change are familiar. Although humanity has, has often been in denial about this, the necessity of living with change is intrinsic to the human condition. Our planet, just in geological earth science terms, is tumultuous, even when some species, in this case, Homo sapiens, is not further forcing the dramatic changes. And even without climate change, the 20th century was a time of enormous upheaval and tumult that led to generational rupture. I do not live in the same world as my father, much less my grandfather. Understanding how to live gracefully, justly, and with meaning is a traditional role for the humanities. Drawing on these resources, the methodologies, the texts, the sources of reflection is both unavoidable and necessary in navigating the challenges of our time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dale, for your thoughtful remarks. And uh, we have some time for discussion. Um, between uh, for a few, you've raised some very important questions, and as somebody who is listening to you and trying to put these thoughts together, um, there are some um, obvious questions that come up. One is, of course, that this is, as all of you have emphasized, either through, as Roger was speaking about, Confucian approach or even when nation states come and speak through the IPCC or before the IPCC or to the UN as nation states uh, in that collective approach, we all assume that we have one air and one planet and that the IPCC's ideas about carbon budgets, you know, the timetable they give out for, um, for um, getting to uh, what Professor Fujin was talking about, about uh, eventually to negative emotions, but, uh, emissions, but also to uh, zero emissions. All of these are planetary targets within which we try to accommodate the question of historical responsibility, justice, um, being a more developed nation, being a less developed nation. Um, it's one question that arises to me, listening to all of you, particularly listening to you, Dale, uh, is 1860, uh, 20, 20, 2000, sorry, 20, 2060 or 2030, will these numbers help us? I mean, are we already in deep trouble? Uh, it was interesting listening to the panel because as we went from, you know, Professor MS to Dale, the mood got slightly darker. And, uh, and when, when it came today, you were reminding us that we are already in it, uh, climate change. And it, it reminded me, I was thinking, uh, will, will this kind of remark give rise to desperation? And it reminded me of a, a story by the great Chinese writer Lu Sun that I read growing up in Calcutta, uh, which was a very dark story of some people being cooped up in a room from which there was almost no escape. And somebody apparently asked, Lu Sun, why do you tell such a such a dark story? And he said, well, I was hoping that maybe we'll want to do something out of sheer despair. <laughs> so, so I thought, you know, despairing has its points uh, and optimism uh, has its points. And I think we need both. We need kind of... Uh, so with those things in mind and, we, and given the fact that humanity, scholars in the humanities thrive on disagreements, we don't, we're under no pressure to... Uh, emerge into a consensus, though there are obviously overlaps in our understanding and already some implicit agreements that this is a huge predicament we face. So one, some, let me just raise some questions and any of you who uh, should feel free to answer them. One is of course, the question of the relationship between values and technology. So 
Um, Roger talked about you know the Confucian values emphasizing collectivity over individualism. And as I was listening to Fujun talking about technology, I was wondering whether technology is value neutral or do values, uh, do different value systems make for different kinds of technologies or even different understandings of technology? Uh, given how important technology is to modern society, that was one question I had. Uh, the second question was, of course, given the plurality of human interests, uh, both as nation states, as individuals, uh, do you think it would be possible for humanity to act to given planetary calendars of climate action? I mean, this is a, this is a problem where even when you make room for our differences and, and accommodate differences, there still needs to be a time by which we need to get rid of carbon emissions, get to negative carbon emissions. So how do we combine this kind of universal goal with our different positions, different values? Uh, do you think it is realistic uh, from your experience? The third question I was thinking about uh, given that you know we have two people based in based in uh, Peking and and we have two scholars myself and Liz who are mentally situated in South Asia, I was actually thinking of this mountain range we call the Himalayas. Now the, from the Himalayas issue eight or nine rivers that actually service eight or nine nations from Pakistan to Vietnam. You know, recently a great uh, Indian ecological worker died, and he, he in one of the last interviews, he he was reminding us that um, that the main product of the Himalayas is water, not apples. <laughs> and as far as I know, these all these countries that are actually serviced by the mountain and by the glaciers, because not all, but most of these are glacier-fed rivers. There is no multilateral agreement between these different nations benefiting from what the Himalayas do. On the, on the one hand, given the geopolitics of the situation, the Himalayas today have become one of the most militarized mountain range in the world. And human politics, nation-state politics is geopolitical. It's not driven by geology or geobiological, and there's a gap between our geopolitical interests, our understanding of politics, and the kind of biosocial, geobiological understanding of politics that we'll have to arrive at if we want to act together. On the other hand, nation states are critical for many other reasons, and we'll have to work through the nation states. And sometimes I wonder if regional initiatives, like actually having a multilateral agreement, between these different countries that benefit from the Himalayas and reducing the militarization of the mountain. Because you know, militarization means that the mountain is dynamited. It's a young growing mountain. And because it's growing and unstable, dynamiting this mountain often leads to landslides. And on the Indian sides, I know that, and Liz would know, it's led to grave disasters. But there's dam building going on, there's road building going on, there's helipads and, you know, so that army, uh, the play armies can go, planes can, that's all going on. So the, my third question is really about this tension between our geopolitical understanding of the political and what I would call the geobiological understanding of the political that needs to emerge and how we get there. So, you know, those are broad questions. I'm very happy to listen to all of you all, as I said. We don't need to agree. Uh, we fortunately belong to subjects where we, we thrive on disagreements and differences, but but even differences uh, illuminate problems. So please, whoever wants to come in, uh, maybe you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Or, okay, yeah, uh, Professor Fu, please. Uh, let me uh, try to give very brief uh, uh, cut into the three sets of very interesting questions you have. I will try to be very brief. Uh, the first uh, sets of question, I think one way to think about that, the, the tensions are 
uh, the knowledge, technology uh, or knowledge and uh, the value uh, that we have to talk about. Uh, to answer that is to sort of cite uh, the two uh, quotations. One is from Francis Bacon. The other is uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes. Francis Bacon said, knowledge itself is power. Uh, Hobbes is more sophisticated. He said, knowledge is a potential power. Being a political scientist, a social scientist, uh, Hobbes was probably thinking of the social uh, institution technologies as an intermediate uh, factor to consider. So for technology or knowledge uh, to translate to in line with the values we have, uh, we need to design better institutions, as I said, better institution technologies. Now, there are initial uh, evidence that at least now we human beings have realized uh, going on in the same direction probably won't work. Well, if assuming human beings are self-interested even, right? <laughs> it will kill yourself. Ultimately, uh, I think, uh, well, with the right direction, the next phase is to scale up that direction. So this is uh, uh, my way to answer the first set of the question. Uh, question. Now, the second uh, set of question, um, it's, to me, it's uh, the tension between general justice and the particular justice. Probably for anthropological reasons or historical reasons, the starting points are different across different time space on this earth. But ultimately, we as human beings need to have a general goal while considering the particular circumstances that each nation states, if you may, face uh, with uh, the, the general goal, but considering uh, particular circumstances. To me, what uh, impressed me about China is doing is in a very subtle way, Chinese political philosophy in the way behind the climate change has changed gradually from particular justice to general justice. That's why we say, well, in spite of uh, the particular circumstances uh, that we have in terms of uh, development stage, we are committed to carbon neutrality by the year 2060, even though the time lag is 10 years, but given the circumstances. So by committing uh, to carbon neutrality, now, this is a very strong indication that China is looking for general justice. We are human beings, okay, in spite. And the last is about uh, geopolitical politics and uh, uh, what have you, or the spin off of those have you. And that I would uh, argue uh, generating force within the second uh, sets of uh, my answer to the second question. Well, it's unfortunate, uh, on this very small village we call the Earth, uh, the very uh, the fact of matter is at the very fundamental level, the whole system is uh, built up on the basis of nation states. Well, this is the harsh reality in a way, but gradually we should come together. And the encouraging sign, initial sign is that United Nations, even though it's not a sovereign state, individual state of sovereign states, United Nations is not, but it's a quasi central government. They need to be backed up by the big powers first, then all uh, nation states. At least come up with uh, quasi uh, uh, techno uh, uh, institute technologies in the framework of uh, UNFCCC, UN uh, framework of convention for climate change. You have a structure and where uh, as we move along, each nation should make nationally determined uh, commitments to that chamber. Hopefully, uh, as we move on, we human beings, uh, in addition to the things we do simulation, dealing with the different scenarios, uh, we are also good emulation. As we move along, we learn from each other and we come together to attack uh, the common uh, threat that we all face. Thank you, thank you. Any other? Um... Yeah, please, please. Um, yeah, thank you for those very interesting questions. And to build on Professor Fu's answer a little there, I'll start with the geopolitics. Um, you asked whether planetary action is possible. And I agree, it's easy to look at the UNFCCC and say, well, it's impossible. It's one country, one vote. 
But even being a humanist, I can do some addition in ways that give me some optimism. So if we look at annual emissions currently, we have, and this depends on a little on how you calculate it, but not too much. China around 30%, the United States around 14%, and the European Union around 12%. Add those together then, about 55, 56% of emissions in just those three actors. So we actually don't need to get, you know, 193 parties in a room to agree. We need three actors really to see very meaningful change on climate change. And of course, we saw this with the Paris Agreement. It was entirely founded on US-China bilateral action. Now, you might say this also seems like a stretch in the current moment. But I also feel optimistic if I look at your water issue about some ways that this geopolitics could go. I think breaking up climate change into more tractable problems is actually a way forward. And dealing in what political scientists like to call clubs rather than everybody. So we might look at India and Pakistan, hated enemies, but they have agreed on the Indus Water Treaty, about the only thing they've agreed on since 1960. There's a precedent there. And I see this kind of model um, for other issues, black carbon in East Asia, for example. Is it possible then that we should be thinking of groups of maybe five, six countries coming together to solve problems rather than everyone all at once? Seems like a good idea to me because I've been alive nearly as long as the UNFCCC negotiations, and I don't see much optimism for that big gathering. Um, on your very interesting question about the relationship between values and technologies, these philosophers in the room will have much more interesting stuff to say. I would just say, I think this is a great question because it poses the more fundamental problem of how technology shapes us. You know, we look at something as big as the electric grid, and it's bigger than any one person, any one institution's ability to steer it, because it's the biggest machine in the world, uh, if we look at China's electric grid, say. So I think this is a re really serious challenge, how we actually tackle technology in ways that restore some human control over these very long-lived enormous infrastructures that now date back a century or something like this. Anyway, I would love to hear from my, my colleagues. Yes, I would too. Roger and, and Dale, please. Yeah, Dale, you had your hand up and then we'll go to Roger. So, well, let me begin by just <clears throat> making a comment on the technology question and then expressing a dark thought and then a somewhat uh, cheerier thought. Um, on the technology question, I, I think it's, um, I, I, look, it, it, I, I have, in a way, uh, I, I'm going to disappoint Liz because I actually have very crude thoughts about this. I think the political economy of technology, who owns it, who controls it, is really the fundamental question about technology. Um, I think in the renewable energy area, the obvious um, example is that when solar energy first started to come on the horizon, certainly now this is again more in a North American context, it was really a challenge to the idea of the grid. It, it was, I mean, the, the, the idea of sort of more individualism, more self-reliance, the idea that you could sort of unplug from the multinational corporations that controlled the large energy uh, production was, was part of the impulse uh, about behind the development of that technology in the early stages. But of course it didn't go that way. And a similar story can be told about the internet. Uh, the internet could have actually been something besides the world's biggest shopping bazaar and the world's largest portal for pornography. Uh, had it simply been controlled by different people and not monetized in the way that it that it was. So, uh, so that's my rather naive and reductive view about technology. Now, uh, now the dark thought. Um, so, you know, sometimes people worry about whether we're going off of a cliff because we're irrational and sort of who, you know, what's really going on with these leaders of nation states and so on. 
I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is the contrast between what we might call global or general rationality and local rationalities. The, the problem is, I mean, if I even think of my own case, I, I, I have an aspiration where there's a kind of general rationality that I will sort of link all of the horses, you know, of my humors, you know, so that they will all be pulling in the same direction. But that's not what happens. I mean, the, you know, my concern for the way food tastes collides with my concern for health and my concern for my career, you know, collides with the love I have for my family, all, all of these things. And so I'm always acting rationally in some way or another. The problem is how these rationalities can all be yoked together. And I think the same thing is true of nation states. I think the same thing is true of industrial sectors and so on. There's always a rational explanation for why we're driving ourselves off the cliff. Our aspiration is to get to a more unified, integrative, general rationality. Uh, and in a way you can see global agreements as being, as being like that. It's, it's it, their aspirations, their attempts to yoke all these local rationalities, but they are about as powerful at the global level as my aspiration for a general rationality to govern how I live uh, is, is for me. Now the slightly more cheery thought, which I have to say, you know, to, su to some extent um, may just be be happy thinking. Um, I mean, I believe that if we really don't destroy ourselves, and I think the most likely way we would destroy ourselves is actually with nuclear weapons, but if we don't destroy ourselves, I think we will get beyond the carbon economy. I don't know when we'll get to it, whether it'll be 2030 or 2050 or 2100, but we will stumble towards it enough of these local rationalities will align through time uh, so that we'll reach some kind of economic tipping point and you know people who run the global economy will land in another in another place uh, you know a, a lot of people will die a lot of injustice will be done a lot of nature will be destroyed but i'm fairly confident that we'll get there now adaptation is a different matter um, adap i mean first of all adaptation is more local than global. You, you can't even really try to do the equivalent of the framework convention on adaptation or something and, you know, and think that you can solve that from the, from the top down way. Um, and, and because adaptation is local, there's also some room for optimism there, which is that people, lo that people living their own lives on a daily basis will figure things out in some way as they have always done uh, to a much greater extent than experts expect them to. Yeah. Dale, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll yeah. have to come I in just, here and, sorry, finish, finish the thought. We well, were say, but, and we did, but, yeah. but, but on the other hand, people need resources and they need support and they need help. Yeah. And most of all, they need to not have large impersonal globalized forces squashing them. So yeah, yeah. no, that point taken. And Roger, you have the last word for now, before we transition to questions from audiences. So sure, sure. We've been waiting for um, a few more minutes, but yeah. I think, um, I think one of the major problems we have, like I wanted to make the argument that we need a, a radical change in values, intentions, and practices. So how do we get that? We're, we have a world that is dominated by the Westphalian modern state system. Uh, and along with that comes liberal values. Uh, what, what, what we have is we have a world that um, where there's a kind of international anarchy, everyone out for themselves. Um, so how do we how do we um, how, how do we maintain our our plurality? Michael Walzer, the political philosopher, talks about thick and thin moralities. Like it's really great, you know, that we have Christianity and Hinduism and and Islam and uh, Ubuntu and liberalism and and Confucianism. Um, so how do we how how do we maintain all of that divergent? One of, one of my colleagues at the University of Hawaii, a woman named Rinda Dalmia, would talk about epistemic injustice. Epistemic injustice is when other ways of thinking are invisibilized 
by the liberal, the, the domination of liberalism. And so maybe what we need is we need to move from sort of an international conversation, geopolitics, to a dialogue among civilizations. Can we find, can we, can we have our thick moralities, which are, are good, uh, uh, po politics of pluralism, but at the same time, find some kind of minimalist morality that brings us all together. We're fragmented. What brings us together? And um, uh, Walzer himself argues for a garden variety, common conception of justice. I would, I would, I would add the Confucian um, uh, alternative to that, and that would be family feeling. That what has maintained. The, this this place called China, not a nation state, you know, a population larger than Africa, a population larger than almost the combination of Eastern and Western Europe. What has kept this world together for so long has been this, the 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 primacy of family, and so uh, and 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 it's not that you would take a Confucian idea and persuade a an, an Italian or a Zimbabwean, but rather that if you say family is our most fundamental value, they themselves would acknowledge that within their thick morality, that, 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 that family feeling is also the, their most basic value. So I think, I think that the, these different civilizations that we have, have a great deal to contribute, but they're, 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 there's this epistemic invisibility um, that that uh, they they don't have a voice. Roger, so what need... I'll do, I'll, I'll I'll actually, if you don't mind, segue into the two or two or three audience questions. We're running a little short of time, but the sure. question is addressed to you, Roger. Uh, <laughs> there's one addressed to you, so it's really saying the question is asking uh, the. the about the specific contribution of thinking us as becoming human to solve or mitigate problem of climate change, could you give us some illustration of how this concept of becoming human from the Confucian tradition can help us deal with climate change? Can you give a very short answer to that question? Just an example. I, I of... can. I can indeed. That the difference between a human being is something that is predetermined. Like if we think of the classical Greeks, the, the being is the reality. The being is the object of knowledge. But in the Confucian tradition, a human becoming means that the, the individuality, the distinctiveness of somebody is a function of the quality of their relationships with the, their environing others. And so that has, there's, it has a social aspect, but it also has an environmental aspect. That, that Confucianism is not grounded in a concept of simple equality, but in relational equity. Um, my granddaughter, Sophia, has a glass of milk to make her bone strong. A grandpa has a glass of wine in order to sleep, uh, get a good night's sleep. It's not the same thing, but there's an equity to it. And that equity produces diversity. And, and so, so this Confucian concept of a human becoming is grounded in relational equity and achieved diversity. Okay, thank you. And there, there are a couple of questions for Professor Fu. And um, um, so one question is asking you, again, for examples, illustrating how what you call institutional technology should evolve to solve the climate issue. So. Would you think of the institutional technology as the final stage of the four technologies? So a quick word, Professor Fu, explaining what you meant by institutional technology? Well, a good example for us to think about institutional technology is the market itself as the institutional technology. And the market is a very powerful tool that we human beings created. Now, in the case of climate change, we build ETS emission trading systems that was coined by the Europeans. It's a basic uh, carbon uh, market. That institution, uh, if it works, would align incentives with the values we have, okay? The values, if we think of the values, uh, what is a good life? Um, wisdom, virtue, wealth. Well, if only have three, what's the best combination? So we need to 
incentivize a realignment of those values with the incentive we have. So this is a good example of institutional technologies. Of course, the story can go on and on. The UN system is an institution technology. Of course, there are a lot of loopholes there. We need to sort of uh, better knit that institution technology. I will okay. stop here. Yeah, thank you. And you can come back to a later question. So there's another question which I would invite um, Dale and Liz to respond to, uh, but then of course others are free too. So the question is asking, what weight should we give to the interests of future people? There are some moral reasons for caring more about the interests of current people while caring less about the interests of future people. First, we cannot predict what will happen in the future. Future people may find some new energy resources and no longer need fossil fuels. Uh, they might find some effective methods to respond to climate change. Secondly, according to Parfit, our choices have some effect on the number and identities of future people. For example, if the current people use fewer disposable condoms, uh, the number and the identities of future people might be changed. That is the moral objects will be changed. Do you agree that we should care less about the interests of future people? If not, or if so, what weight should we give to the interests of Tanborn? And can I actually add to that the question of the non-human, which you both raised indirectly and indirectly? Uh, maybe Liz and Dale, you can take that question. Well, I've spent many years do dodging the attempt to try to give some answer to that question that looks algorithmic. And in fact, it almost in a way, try to reframe the question. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say this and be very brief. We can get pretty far into the future by caring about children, by grandchildren and the next, and the next generation. And then recognizing some of the values that I think Roger and others were talking about, which are the bare minimal things that anybody will need who comes after us, whatever their preferences may be in their conceptions of the good life, things like food, water, and so on. And as far as the non-human world goes, I will, I will just say this, we live in a community of life. Uh, the same forces that gave rise to us gave rise to every other living thing on the, on the planet. And the one important step towards wisdom is to recognize that commonality. Liz? I don't have too much to add as a non-philosopher, although I did used to live opposite Derek, the late Derek Parfit. Um, what I would say is, um, as a historian, a lapsed political scientist, I maybe approach this more from Professor Fu's uh, position of realism, which is to acknowledge that we are going to care less about future generations than we currently do. And rather than algorithmically rationalizing that away, we should try and institute political procedures to make sure that we at least have to give some reckoning to future generations and the non-human. To me, the, the how question is as interesting as the precisely what weight question. And I see some interesting innovations around the world. Um, in Wales, for example, part of the United Kingdom, there's a commissioner for, the fu for future generations whose job is to think about and articulate the interests of future generations. I think applying this to parts of the non-human world would be a very interesting exercise. So far, I know of very few or no experiments to put this into true structures of governance rather than advisory roles. But I do actually think that this is a current of institutional experimentation that I expect to throw up some very interesting innovations in the years to come. And it's one that I encourage because it's like our conscience telling us we have to at least articulate what we're ignoring, even if we are going to run roughshod over those interests. So there's another question which um, is for all of you are uh, welcome um, uh, for responses. It, um, and I'll add a little bit to the question. The question from Matthew Park says, how do you convince large numbers of people, 10 million, 100 million, to change their habits? And this, the, the first part of the question reminded me of what you were, what you were um, saying about diets. 
the what we eat. For example, you could tell everybody to drive less, but that doesn't mean a large number of people would actually do so. If laws existed to change people's habits, those would be more powerful, but how could you convince people without such enforcement? So it's asking this question about choice versus enforcement. And these might be false choices. I'm not trying to produce a binary, but um, I'd, I'd invite whoever, all of you, <laughs> To respond to this um, question. Uh, Depeche, I just yeah. wanted to, you know, this idea of future generations. Right, sure. The, the Confucian tradition is all about the intergenerational transmission of a living cultural tradition. And so there is an, a, a sense of the idea that the progenitor lives on in the progeny that physically we see ourselves as being similar to those who have come before but in this confucian tradition it's the more than the physicality is the is the culture is the um is the civilization that lives on and 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 i think just to go to just, just very quickly to your second question um responsibility is responsiveness i think that um that what dale was saying earlier and that is you have sort of policy uh, uh, ways of dealing with things. But we also have to get to a point where each of us individually takes responsibility for living in the world in a way that is conducive to sustainability. And Professor Fu? How do we pers <laughs> persuade a uh, large number of people? It will take a long process. I tend to think ultimately human beings are rational, but for the time being, their rationality is contextual. Uh, so there, there, you give a space to the consideration of uh, consu uh, uh, Confucianism. But let me also point out there are good things about Confucianism, also bad things about Confucianism, which value we have. Confucian is also a very hierarchical uh, system, uh, the value that we have. Let the emperors be emperors, ministers be ministers, father be father, son be sons. Those uh, kind of things are probably uh, not fitting uh, in modern times. So we take each individual very seriously. Everyone is equal, but we also think of uh, considerations. But given uh, the human rationality, I say it's contextual, uh, it probably will, the process need to be led by leadership first. Now we are not talking about nation states, we are talking about big nation states vis-a-vis small nation states, we are talking about different shares, distributionary justice uh, there. Uh, then, well, our fight against the climate change need to be led by big powers first. No, I, I You're right to point agree with out you. Uh, uh, US, China, EU, the big uh, post, and then hopefully in the process of persuasion, okay, with the values, green is good, uh, fossil base is not good, non-fossil base is good, and gradually uh, people will get along to the wagon, and we negotiate ourselves, we human beings negotiate ourselves uh, out of this uh, uh, tragedy of commons, is it? In a way, what we should visualize is uh, in the, in the, as a part of uh, persuasion is to take uh, climate change, the threat uh, posed by climate change as some threat imposed on us from ex terrestrials And we have to come together to save ourselves. It is out of your own good, you know, out of your own interest, each individual, each nation state. And we have to come together uh, in this uh, small village, we say small village, if you look at uh, the universe that we call Earth. It so takes a long time. Yeah. Now, the leadership question is, is interesting, and it kind of connects with another question we have uh, from the audience. Uh, and it begins by expressing... Uh, you know, uh, a familiar, I think, uh, skepticism about politicians. And it says no country can rely on their Congress or Parliament to do good. We need a subcommittee of an organization like the UN to take decisions for the world and make the decisions binding 
on all countries. Now, this raises a very interesting question about, it goes back to what uh, Professor Fuyu was saying before about uh, giving the UN more teeth. Now, this question came up, you know, when the pandemic was going on, uh, there was a debate about whether or not WHO should be given more powers to intervene. And um, clearly, I mean, this what is a difficult proposition hasn't happened yet. So is the question of giving the United Nations kind of a planetary governmental powers, as you were suggested before, would you think that is still um, far away from where we are? Or would that yeah, we are still we are still far away. If uh, we are a believer in Marxism, if we are a believer in the wisdom or the intellectual power of Einstein, or in the philosophical tenets of uh, Emmanuel Kant, uh, they all point to the direction as uh, the midway towards the ultimate freedom of mankind. Uh, point to the way of uh, a world government. But the reality is that we still have a system at the bottom of it is nation states. Why uh, that's the case, we probably need to find a bi biological <laughs> uh, knowledge for that. Why it's on the small earth, uh, we still are divided. But if I look at the vector, small vector moving direction, uh, there are some realizations probably ultimately we should move in that direction. Now, in the absence of that, Technology potentially is dangerous because uh, uh, based on nation state, what if technology is getting weaponized? We human beings uh, kill ourselves. And uh, we are on the verge of that. If you look at the case of nuclear power, the greatest scientist uh, all uh, spoke out very strongly uh, against nuclear power. But now we get the guinea out of the box. The challenge is how we can control that. And there we have to build very sophisticated but, uh, but, institution but was, technologies. Sure, but I was, I was, the, the question was also raising by implication the uh, a point about the relationship between what we do with regard to the crisis of climate change and democracy versus some kind of compulsion. See, the the, the 2015 Paris Agreement gave us. Uh, gave nations to determine nationally determined uh, contributions that they would make. Obviously, it was not a mandate. Uh, so this question really, for me, it also sort of um, transforms into a question of the relationship globally between global action and values of democracy. And can I invite um, Dave to come in on this? So, um, I mean, the first thing is there really is no daddy here. There is no Superman. There, the Lone Ranger isn't going to come and save us. What we, we, we live in a world in which there are many concentrations of power organized in different ways. The nation state is an obvious one. Some states are stronger than others, but there are also multinational corporations. There's all kinds of other sources of power they get projected into the world. So it's not as though these sources of power are all going to say, let's give it, you know, sort of in a Hobbesian bargain, let's give it all over to some sovereign. Let's call it the United Nations and have the United Nations solve all of our problems. So what we have, particularly with the nation state, is a kind of ongoing conversation between the state and its people, whether that's in a democracy or whether that's in something that we don't call a democracy, there is some kind of ongoing set of permissions granted in, in both directions. Um, so, the, so just to, to finish very quickly, the first thing I would do is to sort of reject a very strong dichotomy between democracies and non-democracies here, and instead try to think about how power can be organized and used in ways that are acceptable and permitted to do a better job of addressing the challenges that we face than is now occurring. Thank you. So we have two more minutes left of a discussion time and I want to give one minute each to Liz and, and, and Roger to have to express their thoughts on this question or anything else that struck you as important. <laughs> 
Um, perhaps I could go first just on this question okay. of uh, enforcement, because I think that um, it's also not a decision between a sort of um, authoritarian center that by makes uh, agreements binding or nothing. Take the Paris Agreement. I mean, a lot of its power rests on naming and shaming, but I would not underestimate this. I mean, most countries with a few notable exceptions in the news a lot at the moment don't like being shamed by being pariahs do believe in uh, being perceived as legitimate members of the international community but more than this i think there are all sorts of imaginative tools of enforcement that countries need to start thinking about and perhaps especially china leading amongst them so for example take the european union which keeps mooting the notion of having a, a carbon tax that especially, especially targets cross-border trade. That is using the fact that it's the largest economic block in the world to say, well, you need to improve your environmental performance. Um, imagine if China did this. China is now the largest international lender in the global south. This would have real teeth without us needing something like a UN army. Imagine as well, you know, if we look to the example of the ozone crisis and the Montreal Protocol, a lot of that was about compensating losers, saying there will be extra time for developing countries. And it was about sharing technology, saying, look, we've developed something better. Here it is. All of these are ways that we can accelerate change without making this about an authoritarian world government, I think. Thank you, Liz. And Roger, the last one minute and the very last word on this panel. Okay, well, that's very nice. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll just recall something that Liz uh, said earlier, and that is that if we have a dialogue among civilizations um, where, think of the diaspora, you know, we're not, we're not talking about China, we're talking about Southeast Asia, Vancouver, Singapore, that if we have a, a dialogue among civilizations, there are some items that we can identify where the world can come together. And one of them is certainly uh, environment. Another one of them would be pandemic. And maybe we can have an international uh, kind of organization that deals piecemeal with, with things that we can agree upon. Um, and then and then look for uh, Dale's point, and that is then look for accommodation among things what, that we can't agree upon. Roger, thank you so much for, for that very wise remark, but also for keeping to your one minute, <laughs> which makes my job a little bit easier. But look, what can I say? This has been a terrific panel. You've all spoken wonderfully, truthfully, and, and uh, wisely to the problem at hand. And uh, I said we all disagree in the humanities, but actually there was much more agreement on this panel <laughs> than, than disagreement, which, which uh, is a very positive and optimistic note on which we can end. Thank you all very much. Before I go, uh, well, thank you to, to all of you. And, and before I go, uh, I would I'd like to invite you, the audience, to the next panel entitled Turning Down the Temperature, How the Finance Industry is Impacted impacting corporate climate action, which will be on Thursday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Central Time or Friday, October 21st at 8 a.m. China Standard Time. Thank you all very, very much. And the event concludes here. Thanks. <laughs>